Good morning to all of you early risers. I'm Jeff Mausner, the chair of the Tarzana Neighborhood Council Animal Welfare Committee, and I will be the moderator. I'll introduce our panelists. Bob Blumenfield is the Los Angeles City Council member for the third district covering Canoga Park, Reseda, Tarzana, Winnetka, and Woodland Hills. He serves on the City Council Budget, Planning, and Information Technology Committees. He's chair of the Public Works Committee. Uh, Councilman, you'll have to get on the Animal Welfare Committee next session. Prior to the City Council, he served in the California State Assembly, where he was chair of the Budget Committee. Before that, he worked in Washington, D.C. on the staff of a senator uh, and a congressman. Uh, he has a long bio on his city council website, and I will add to that that he has been a very strong advocate for animals, um, some of which we will discuss today. Dana Stangell is also a strong advocate for animals. She was president of the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council and chair of its Animal Issues Committee. She's currently the executive director of the Taranga Ranch and is a biology teacher. Some links to the website of the Taranga Ranch are on the last page of the written materials. And um, I put a link for the written materials into the chat. Is that there now? Okay. Yes, thank you, Vanessa, for sending that to everyone. Okay, so um, let's start. Uh, Councilman Blumenfield, we worked on a number of animal welfare matters together. I chose six items, which are included in the written materials for the workshop. Um, everyone can follow along in the materials. Um, and these six matters are listed in the table of contents. Let's start out with the most recent, saving the West Valley Animal Shelter. Because of the COVID pandemic, all of the city departments had to cut their budgets. The Animal Services Department was supposed to cut $3.9 million. The department wanted to cut its budget by closing the West Valley Shelter and turning it into a community resource center run by private organizations. Coincidentally, at the time I found out about this, you were scheduled to be a speaker at the Tarzana Neighborhood Council meeting. So I alerted some of my fellow volunteers and animal control officers at the shelter who attended the meeting and spoke in opposition to closing the shelter. Um, the minutes from that meeting are at pages two to five of the uh, written materials. So uh, Councilman, please take it from there and tell us what happened with the West Valley shelter. Sure, thank you. Um, and Jeff, I wanna start by just thanking you not only for moderating this panel, but you have been such a tireless advocate for uh, animal welfare issues and, and other things, but, but uh, I have loved partnering with you on, on issues. I'm, I'm so happy that, you, that you're in, uh, that we're in the same district. Uh, so we get to work together on lots of, lots of different things. Uh, I have learned a tremendous amount from you over the years. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to put that out there to, to, to get us started because, uh, you know, this city is great because we have so many great people in this city who give their time. Uh, and, and that's part of what everyone here on the neighborhood councils uh, is part of. And, and you exemplify that uh, in, in so many ways. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to put that out there. And it's an honor, Dana, to be on the panel with you as well. You've been a, a fierce advocate as well for animal welfare issues. And I, and I try to do my part as a council member and, and prior to that as an assembly member, I've always had a passion for, uh, for animal welfare issues. And, and you know, particularly, we, you know, we, government is, uh, 
you know, the, the test of government is, is how we treat those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and, and that includes, you know, not just uh, people who are vulnerable, but, but all, all living beings who are vulnerable. So I think it's important. These issues are important as they come up and, and, uh, and I'm happy to be part of this. So, real, so to, to go to the West Valley uh, Animal Shelter. Yeah, the good news is it, it, is, it is back. Uh, you know, we had, a, we had a scare for a while because during, during COVID, I mean, the whole world changed during COVID in so many ways, but as a city, you know, we lost 10% of our revenues. Uh, folks were trying to struggle how to, how to deal with the health issues. Uh, the West Valley Shelter was temporarily closed, uh, ostensibly to reduce staff exposure not just about budgeting. We were always promised it was not going to be closed, closed. Uh, but then the department started coming up with some other creative options. I was skeptical the whole time, but tried to keep an open mind to hear what the department was saying. Is there, is there ways to do this that the way the, they were talking about? But it, it became apparent after a while that, and especially as, as the city was starting to get some additional funds that this going this other route didn't make sense. Uh, and so I was happy to partner actually with council member John Lee on a motion that helped sort of finally open the, you know, ensure that the doors would open in, in March of 2021. That was, uh, for those so following along, we could probably put the link on there, but it was called long-term plan for West Valley animal shelter. I put a couple of amendments in there as well to, to make sure that, um, you know, that, that our, our animal services issues and that, that, that specifically the staffing would be there. Uh, and the neighborhood councils uh, were great. I mean, the, the 13 different neighborhood councils submitted community impact statements, taking the position to keep the West Valley shelter open as it is, as a city shelter. Um, again, I had amendments about the roles and the duties of the different staff members that are essential for reopening it, getting, getting those questions out. Uh, so the good news is, thanks, thanks to you, Jeff, thanks to the community, thanks to basically us taking a deliberative process on, at the city level and making sure that, yes, we, we, we listen to the different options, but at the end of the day, uh, kept that shelter open. So that is a, a good example of a success story and a great example of neighborhood councils leaning in and making a difference. Um, you mentioned that there were, there were 13 neighborhood councils that uh, submitted community impact statements. Um, also, the Valley Alliance of Neighborhood Councils yep. Bank passed a motion on that. What effect does that have? Does that help you in moving forward in, in getting something done when there is a very strong showing of community? Um, yeah, uh, it, 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 may, it, it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, and after the, after the bank did its, its thing and, and, and those statements came in, the city acted quickly. We held several meetings, three meetings over six months to address the concerns. And those concerns that were raised became the basis of, of the questions that we asked. So um, I'd say that, that that was very important um, to making it happen, especially something like this really, which was a question, you know, the department was raising, you know, the department that is in charge of this was raising some serious questions and, and had alternatives. And so getting the the public and people who are really close to the issue to put not only their views, yes, no, but, but to have thoughtful statements with real questions makes a difference because it's not just a question, you know, from a council perspective, it, you don't sit there and you're way, well, I have 10 statements for it and 11 against it, so I'm gonna be against it or something. It, it really is the substance that matters too. It's the, the fact that people were asking real tough questions uh, that, we as the, as the council representatives of the neighborhood councils and the people wanna make sure those questions get answered. Uh, and that makes the difference. Yeah. And as you said, the West Valley shelter is uh, back open and operating. Um, it's currently on a modified COVID schedule um, so that on weekends, it's fully open to the public. On weekdays, um, it's appointment only, but they're gonna be uh, considering whether to make it completely open during the week um, if, if COVID improves. So thank you for your work on that. 
we kept the West Valley shelter open, which was a very good thing. Okay, so um, let's go to Dana. Um, Dana, could you talk about your experience with animal welfare issues when you were on the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council? Of course, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, thank you to everyone who's here. I think the Neighborhood Council system is pretty amazing and has so much potential. And I, and it just, it's so exciting to see so many people involved, especially at this hour on a Saturday morning. So you rock. Thank you for being here, everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I actually got involved with the neighborhood council as a result of animal issues in our area. Um, and a lot of people don't think they have animal issues, but everyone has animal issues, whether they know it right in this very moment or not, or they could think back to the animal issue that they had. And it, it doesn't mean that it's a negative issue necessarily. It just means that, you know, there might have been an interaction that was misunderstood or whatever. But we all have animals in our lives, whether there are pets that share our homes or raccoons that share our backyards, right? So, um, and, and in a place like Sunland Tahanga, just as in a place like Watts or Chatsworth, we have wildlife situations and we have pets in backyards and, and other things too. So as a, as a community, people actually reached out to me and said, we have an open space on the neighborhood council and it's, it's an open space and we want it to be for animal stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'm all about it. And so together we, um, we, we made a committee and we met, um, I think it was monthly and we, our thing was, we were spending a lot of time on social media, trying to explain situations that were happening and trying to get the word out about certain things, whether it was a service that was provided by the city or whether it was just some general information about how to coexist. Or we even had a situation as we continue to with fire, evacuation, animal issues regarding natural disasters, right? So um, we had a variety of things going on. Um, and I think it's important to note here that even though the political, the, the neighborhood council system can be and is political by nature, this committee was actually more educational in nature. Unlike the fight for the West Valley shelter, we were not really crusading for anything I'm not sure that's the correct word anymore. I don't even, we, we, weren't, we weren't pushing for something. Um, we just really wanted everyone in the neighborhood to have some basic information about protecting pets in the backyard from wildlife, understanding that wildlife that's in the backyard so they're not afraid of it, um, knowing stuff about disaster uh, and how to evacuate. We covered, we even did a special, we're, a, we're, we're an equestrian area. And um, part of our disaster preparedness um, presentation for animals included um, equine evacuation. So that was pretty cool. Um, we hosted dog and cat adoption clinics. We worked with uh, the Lucy Foundation at the time. And so that was a good way like, hey, now I know about them. And now I know they come to the area regularly. So it was that kind of a thing. And actually we got a lot of animals adopted out, which was really cool. Um, what else did we do? We did a lot of coexistence stuff. We had a presentation that was all about alligator lizards. We sat there for an hour learning about alligator lizards. And I remember it because it was one of the most interesting and best presentations we had. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I love alligator lizards. So that was cool, but it wasn't just wildlife, it was pets. Um, we, uh, we wrote some um, community impact statements as well. So I guess in that sense, we might've been a little bit political. We did one about uh, coyote management in Los Angeles. And we did one, I believe at the time, there was something about keeping exotics for entertainment purposes. And we put in a community impact statement about that. Um, and we had one of our most fun activities was um, a lot of, it was a big community outreach day. And for Earth Day, um, we actually did a barn owl box building demonstration and talked about barn owl boxes and why we wouldn't use rodenticide and why we might 
encourage raptors instead and how we encourage them and why we encourage barn owls instead of great horned owls, for example. And then people, uh, there was a, a raffle and people could go home possibly with their own barn owl box kit. So that was kind of cool. Um, so we just did a lot of stuff like that. It was very educational in the community. And then I feel like what I saw and continue to see on social media, and I'll just name you know, the local Facebook groups, basically, they are passing out good information now. When someone talks about their issue with their dog in their backyard or, you know, coyotes or whatever, I used to be the one to have to jump in all the time with some reasonable explanation or whatever. And now I feel like people in the community have really taken that. And that's very exciting. Um, so, yeah, and unfortunately, our committee is not, um, it's not meeting anymore right now, but I think that these committees can be super great because there's so many different things you can do. It's really fun. Yeah. I, I hope it comes back again. <laughs> Me too. Okay, um, Kesselman Blumenfield, um, let's go to the next topic in the written materials. Stop the dog and cat meat trade in China, Vietnam, South Korea, Cambodia and Indonesia. That starts on page 23 of the written materials. Um, this is an unusual subject matter for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, when I first started working on this, some people thought it would be impossible to get a resolution on this. Uh, but it's so important we work so hard to try to save the life of one dog or cat at the city shelter. You know, the time and money well spent. But the dog meat trade involves the torture and killing of tens of millions of dogs and cats every year. Uh, so I brought it to the Valley Alliance and Neighborhood Councils Bank. Uh, which consists of representatives of all 34 neighborhood councils in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I'm the animal representative at Bank. There was some concern expressed by representatives that this is way outside our jurisdiction. What are we doing considering a resolution regarding uh, what is going on in South Korea or China? And um, several members of VANC, uh, Tony Wilkinson and the founder and president, Jill Banks Barad, said, um, we can do anything we want. We have to do something for these animals. Uh, and the resolution passed almost unanimously. Uh, the resolution is on pages 24 to 26 where I sent it to you and Councilman Rue. Uh, but could you take it from there, Councilman, and um, tell us what happened? And, and your resolution on this is on page 27 in the materials. Uh, your mood. Yeah, yeah, thanks, sir. You set it up perfectly. You, you know, it's, it's one of those issues not traditionally considered by the neighborhood councils, not traditionally considered by uh, the city, but it's an area we, we can have influence. And, um, you know, you brought it with the bank, sent the letter, I think in December of 18. Um, I looked at that as well and talked to you and to others and said, you know, it doesn't take a lot for us to embrace this idea and do a resolution from the city of Los Angeles, asking our federal government to weigh in on this, uh, but it can make a difference because from a sort of diplomacy perspective, LA has a lot of business with um, Asia. We engage a lot, it will, it will make the news, it would, uh, you know, I don't know, shockwave may be too strong of a word, but it, it will send a message um, that, that we care about this and that maybe we can start, it can help, it can be that, that, that last, 
uh, straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, although that's a very bad expression in animal welfare world. Uh, uh, the, 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 it, it can be that extra, um, that extra nudge that we need. So I took it on uh, as well and, and put the resolution forward that's in your notes and, and uh, we worked together and, and it took a little, little work with some of my colleagues to make sure that folks were on board, um, that we weren't singling out one particular nation or another, that we were really, uh, it wasn't about that. It really was about the, the cruelty of the dog uh, meat trade. And we were able to, to get that and, and move it forward. Uh, and it did exactly that. It had an impact. It, it you know, it, it made the news. It helped, it helped create a little bit more of a domino effect. So I'm proud that we were able to do it. Uh, I appreciate that, that it was an effort that was organically started uh, through you, Jeff, and through Vank. And uh, I was happy to, to sort of build that momentum and do my part to move it uh, and make it an official city policy and, and move it forward as a, as a resolution that then gets seen by our Congress. Um, I, I wrote some City Watch articles about this. Um, one of them starts on page 28. Um, as a result of the City Watch article, over 500 people submitted public comments in the city council file in support of your motion. Um, what effect did that have? Um, you don't see many public comments or you don't see that many public comments on most city council resolutions. Did that, did that help convince other uh, council members? <laughs> I have to say it did. I mean, you know, it, it might, it was, it, you know, I said initially there was a motion, you know, and I bring it through, there were some colleagues that had some skepticism about it. Um, but I think the overwhelming, you know, show of support helped people kind of put aside that skepticism and, and move it forward. So we were able to move it forward unanimously. And, yeah. uh, and, and it had that strong public showing, which I think make, not only makes a difference in getting it passed, but I think it also makes a difference in the, in the public perception of it and how the media looks at it and, and sees it as something that it's not just some crazy council member Bloomingfield going doing another animal welfare thing. It's like, wait, this has, this has a, a broad base of support. There's a lot of folks who are really behind this. Um, Koreandogs.org, um, which is an organization that's been working on this for years, uh, highlighted the city council resolution and specifically thanked you for your work on that. Uh, that's on, uh, starting on page 36, they thanked you and, and Councilman Rue for your work. Um, there, there have been some really good developments in stopping dog meat uh, and their links to um, City Watch articles on those developments on page uh, 44. Um, do, do you and your fellow council members read City Watch? I assume that you do. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can't say I read everything in there, but I certainly read uh, a, a number of articles always show up. You know, these days, I don't, I don't read anything in particular. I go on the computer and I read all sorts of things and then I find out where they're from. And a lot of times they're from City Watch or you know, LA Times, everything else. But I, you know, it's, it's funny how we read the news these days is through so many different sources. But it really, you know, again, it, that, that, that one is a great example of how, you know, how the neighborhood council system, how, how just community interest and your, your hard work, Jeff, really, makes a difference and it just it it's it helps get that snowball going down the hill and um you know and that's that's where it started and then obviously it, it's had now national international impact that's that's a huge accomplishment and you should be very proud because you really were the driver yeah well th thank you thank you um so um there there has been progress on this uh in china uh, South Korea, some of the Indonesia, but millions of dogs and cats are still brutally tortured and killed each year. 
Um, because of the city council resolution, it is the official position of the city of Los Angeles to oppose the dog meat trade. Um, Councilman, can you think of things that can be done to use that official position to further stop the dog meat trade? Um, for example, do you and other city officials meet with South Korean officials or other country officials? And can city officials raise the fact that it's the official city position to oppose the dog meat trade in such meetings? And can you or other city council members meet with the uh, South Korean Consul General in Los Angeles to discuss this? What, what are you? What are your ideas for trying to further this? Yeah, no, absolutely. And any opportunity like that that we can, we can certainly, you know, that having the resolution is a is a strong tool. The other piece of the resolution is, you know, it as a city of LA, we have a lobbyist in Sacramento and in in DC that advocates for the positions that are the official positions of the city of Los Angeles. So when we do one of these resolutions, if you if you look at the actual resolution. It doesn't just say this is our opinion. It says it is an instruction to our representatives in D.C. and in L.A. in Sacramento uh, to further this position with those bodies. So as this issue comes before Congress, um, this our having taken this action um, enables and instructs our our D.C. representative because that's where this issue will come to for more, more than anywhere else is in DC, but then they can, they can then be activated and help organize and they can, um, you know, say, Hey, this is the position of my city and that's why I'm advocating. It. Otherwise, uh, you know, our, our, our representatives there would have, wouldn't have the authority to do that. Um, can you, could you contact that, our, our lobbyists and remind them about this and, and see if there's anything that they can do. Sure, no, we, we can absolutely do that. And, and especially as we, um, you know, if, if as we read about when there's issues that when we know that the issue is coming forward, that's the time to for me to call the lobbyists and say, hey, this is coming forward. I want to make sure you're there at that hearing. Because mm -hmm. um, they, they send us a report every few months about things that are going on and they try to respond to the things that we have on our on our uh, agenda, but I can certainly, I can certainly do that. Um, and it also helps me, you know, one of the other hats I wear is I'm the, uh, the, the chair for the California DMO and I'm, I'm on the national DMO. DMO is the Democratic Municipal Officials Organization that represents cities throughout the country. Uh, so I periodically, you know, just yesterday we had a national board meeting, uh, meet with other city elected officials from around the country and and when these things are going on, I usually share them with other cities and say, hey, we've done this great thing. You might want to consider doing. Oh, that'd be great. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, um, Dana. And I'll be my dog is barking a lot. I'll be right back while you're doing this. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Dana, um, could you please tell us about Taranga Ranch? and talk about how neighborhood councils can be involved with that. Of course. So um, I am also a returned Peace Corps volunteer, right? So there I am involved in the neighborhood council and uh, doing less teaching because I have kids and I had to start a nonprofit because I wanted to do stuff. And as a teacher, um, I have a multi-subject credential and, and also a biology credential. And there really isn't a place in the curriculum where students are gonna learn about a coyote or a raccoon. They are gonna find a brightly colored page in a science book talking about endangered species where they're gonna learn about a tiger or an elephant. They're gonna to go to the zoo. They're not gonna see the Mount Lion enclosure because the orangutan exhibit is far cooler, right? So I just personally felt like there is a, a gap in our understanding of native wildlife. In fact, just like we call native plants weeds, we call native wildlife vermin. And 
I just, as a teacher and as someone who loves wildlife and who appreciates all of the jobs that native wildlife does for us, I really felt this need to get this information out there. Um, and also it was, uh, we had an issue in our neighborhood uh, where um, someone saw a mountain lion in their backyard and they called 911. Fish and Wildlife came out, they wound up shooting it dead. Um, and it was a result of that, uh, that AB 132 was passed. And now it's super hard to shoot a mountain lion unless he's like actually threatening a human being, which we know that they rarely are. Um, so, and, and also because, you know, we're all marching in the streets about the elephants that we've learned about, but our native mountain lions are on the brink of extinction because we have freeways that are hemming them in and there's inbreeding going on and they're dying when they either try to cross the freeway or their father will kill them because when you're a big cat, you have to disperse. So we've got real wildlife issues going on in our own backyard. And so the purpose of Taranga Ranch is actually to fill that gap. And while I have been a teacher and I have spent many years talking to kids about animals and ecosystems, I realized that there's a gap in adult understanding of these ecosystems and these animals. And so um, our organization, we do field trips where we take people to see native wildlife in the wild. Many people have never seen a 6,000 pound elephant seal. Many people don't know that monarchs migrate along our coast. That's a whole another issue right now because we're losing them. But in general, our area is so biodiverse. And I think if we understand some of these animals that share our space, we're more likely to appreciate them, less likely to call the exterminator, um, and more likely to allow the wildlife to really do the things they need to do. And I feel like the more people understand about that wildlife, the more likely they are to show up to their neighborhood council meeting, to write the letter to their representative, to say, I want this open space, and I know why I want this open space. I have an opinion about coyote management in LA, and I have reasons why I feel that way, right? So, um, so we do a lot of educational presentations over on the east side of LA where we are. There are not a lot of wildlife organizations. So we try, again, we try to fill that gap. I'm in people's backyards advising them about wildlife potential conflict. Um, I'm helping people keep their dogs safe. That's like one of the number one things that we do. Um, we help people reinforce their chicken coops. Um, we speak at nature centers. We do local workshops. Um, and another thing we do is like, we try to make sure we're at the things that are happening in LA and then we let people know about them. Um, for example, the Natural History Museum just did a super cool bat roost count. And of course, Taringa Ranch wants to be a part of that. So we showed up, we got to be see it all, and then we can share that information to groups that might not otherwise have seen it. Um, we participate in P22 Day, which is coming up in October, very exciting. Unfortunately, due to COVID this year, the in-person stuff will be very limited, but um, there will be a big online thing. Um, so yeah, so, and, and so the way that, that we can work so those are some of the things that we do and um, the way that we can work with neighborhood councils and the way that we worked with our own neighborhood council was a, we can do educational presentations either online or somewhere outside in person, right? Doesn't have to be part of the neighborhood council meeting. It could be a special event that you host. We go to um, homeowners association meetings. Um, we could even just be a resource if you have written material and you're like, you have a question about the wildlife in your backyard and you could just put Taringa information because really that's what we do um, and and the definition of what we do seems to change all the time based on the situation at hand so we just try really hard to get educated about the situations that affect us as Angelinos and then get that information out as much as possible and um, 
Yeah. And so you, we can always be a resource. We can either be a phone call for a question. We can be a phone call for a, Hey, I found this animal. What is it sick? I don't know. The rehabber didn't call me back. I don't know. We talk people through that stuff. Um, and also we have the pet information as well. We may not be as in tune with all of that as we are the wildlife aspect, but because I've been doing this for so long, I know who to call. And so I really like to be, you know, an, an outreach person. And again, all over social media, whenever I can be, and just to be sort of a hub for our area. If you have that animal question, you need a presentation. Maybe your area recently had a bear visit and everybody wants to know more about bears. We can do a bear presentation. But I'll tell you, um, our two most popular presentations, in case anyone is interested, is the backyard wildlife, which is not only who's in your backyard, why are they there, how do you keep your dog safe? That's, that's uh, one of our most popular ones. And then our other super most popular one is coyotes and coexisting with them and understanding a little bit about their behavior. Um, and again, how to protect your pet, because at the end of the day, that's really the information that people want and need. So, and we're at info at TeringaRanch.org, TeringaRanch.org. We're all over Facebook. We're all over YouTube. If you go to YouTube, you can find videos about why, why don't we use humane traps anymore? Why are coyotes in the city? What about mountain lions? What if I see a track? Can I, how can I tell the difference between a canine track and a feline track, right? So these are the things that you can find if you look us up online. And again, I just want to say thank you so much for having us here today. It's really important to get this information out. Thank you, Dana. Um, Councilman, the next subject is saving rock and rescue. Uh, it starts on page 45 of the written materials. The city planning department was moving to shut down rock and rescue because it is in a commercial zone on Ventura Boulevard in Woodland Hills. At the time, the city zoning code did not allow animal rescues in commercial zones. They had to be in industrial zones where of course nobody would see them. Uh, rock and Rescue saves hundreds of animals every year. It would have been a terrible loss if it was shut down. The Tarzana Neighborhood Council passed a resolution to assist Rock and Rescue in obtaining a conditional use permit so it could continue to operate. Uh, that's on page 49. We started a petition for Rock and Rescue that got over 5,000 signatures. Um, uh, Councilman, do you want to take it from there and tell what happened, please? Sure. No, this was a <clears throat> rock and rescue is in, in my district, Woodland Hill, great rescue uh, place, been there many times. In 2015, as you mentioned, the zoning administrator denied a variance request uh, because, and they were, they were saying that, that rock and rescue was out of compliance, they were going to have to shut down. And they went in for a variance um, and they were denied. So it was great that that uh, neighborhood council jumped in. I also jumped in. I went and talked to not only the zoning administrator, but the, all the, the planning folks trying to bring attention uh, to the fact that they're experiencing hardships. And, and, and for me, I, I looked at this as a twofold process. We have, we have the immediate crisis. We do not want to have Rock and Rescue shut down. Uh, and then what did that crisis reveal about the underlying policy and how do I change that? So... You know, first you gotta gotta get the band-aid out and 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 put it on the wound. And the first thing to do was to make sure we could get a conditional use permit for them. And so, um, working with the neighbor councils and all the support, I supported the appeal to the South Valley uh, Area Planning uh, Commission, and uh, and and I was prepared if that if they didn't go the right direction, I was going to pull that to the city council. I was not going to let Rock and Rescue go period um so i fortunately i had that ace in in my pocket where i could bring it to the council but because of all the good work of of the neighborhood council and everyone else we were able to get that uh the south valley 
uh, planning commission to do the right thing. But then we started looking, okay, well, how do we, we don't, this, this, we, we have saved rock and rescue, but this, this has identified a problem. So I introduced a motion back in January, 2017, which basically changed the city zoning code to allow rescue centers in commercial zones. Um, it took nearly two years. Uh, the final vote was uh, in 2019, uh, but it passed and the ordinance went into effect in December. To, to understand it, the old 2017 zoning code, you know, it said that pet shops are allowed in certain commercial zones and in and industrial zones, as Jeff said, but the kennels are only allowed, and kennels are only allowed in an, in an industrial zone, but a pet shop that keeps four or more adult dogs overnight meets that definition of a kennel. So the ordinance modified the definition of a kennel so that a pet shop keeping four or more adult dogs overnight would not be considered a kennel, would be allowed in certain commercial areas as long as it complies with a set of standards. Again, the, the purpose of this, the whole point of this was to allow rescues, which were never considered back when they were writing the original law, um, to be in, in commercial areas because that's how, that's what you want. You want to have the foot traffic. You want people to be walking back and forth and seeing this, this cute little puppy or cat or something and saying, hey, I want to adopt this animal. If you have all of your, uh, you know, your rescues off in far-flung places, people have to know about it and go to them. But allowing them in commercial areas means that they'll get more foot traffic and we'll have more animals rescued, we'll have more lives saved. So uh, I was thrilled that the net result of this was that we, uh, we changed the ordinance and now not only is Rock and Rescue uh, there, but, but other rescues throughout the city can be in commercial areas, be seen by the public. And we had to do some tweaks here and make sure that there was issues with smells that, that other neighbors would, there, there'd be ways to enforce some of that stuff. We got all that, those were all details that could be hammered out. The key was making sure that, that, that they were allowed in commercial areas and now I'm proud to say uh, that they are. And, uh, and, I, and uh, again, I'm grateful to Jeff and the neighborhood council and all the, all the community members who pitched in to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> your, your city council resolution to amend the zoning code and, and allow animal rescues to operate in commercial zones is on page 61. And um, the passage by the city council is on page 62. So um, <clears throat> we're gonna leave some time for questions so we're not gonna be able to get to um, these last three topics. I just wanna mention what they were. Um, increased funding for the Animal Services Department and spay neuter, um, the Jefferson Park Animal Shelter and the citywide cat program. Um, Bob, if you wanted to say a few words about increased funding for animal services and spay neuter, um, I know you know how important that is, and you're on the budget committee. So, uh, sure, I'll be I'll be real quick on it. Just you know, I I was able to help secure full funding for animal sterilization fund this year, an additional seven hundred thousand through the budget process, and this is for low low and no cost spay and neuter vouchers total of 1.8 million for the vouchers. And this year, um, it was looking really bad for the budget. We got some federal money to help stabilize us. We were able to restore six animal care technicians and four vet veterinarian care technician positions with funding, which was a really uh, a, a great feat to be able to pull that off this year. Um, so we're in, we're in a much better place as far as that goes. That's the quick yes. and dirty. Yeah. Okay, um, Vanessa, uh, do you want to open it for questions, please? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. At this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. I do want to share one, Jeff, that we received uh, via the chat, so maybe that's a good start. Um, and then we will ask um, everyone, if, if you have a question after this one, uh, please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Um, and state your name so that uh, the presenters know who to address their answers to. So the first question comes from Imelda Foley. She says, I'm concerned about the high cost of uh, veterinary care, especially for rescued animals. I have two rescued dogs. I spent 200 to $400 a visit. 
more animals could be rescued and saved if the cost of care would not be so uh, uh, prohibitive. So um, would anyone like to address this question? Um, well, uh, one way to deal with that would be through uh, vouchers given out by the Animal Services Department. Um, they do provide vouchers for um, spay neuter. Um, the problem always is, is money. Um, Bob, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Uh, my guess is that there isn't, isn't money for that, but you know, maybe we can find some. <laughs> You're, you're muted. It's a pro, it's a big problem. And, and I know firsthand, I, you know, um, talk, related to the other issue, my, my dog was actually attacked by a coyote and, and uh, needed stitches and everything else. And um, I mean, happened in the backyard, happened very quickly and, and every, everybody's fine and the dog's fine, but it's very expensive. Um, you know, animal care can be very expensive. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, healthcare in this country too is very expensive. We need to figure out, you know, I'm a fan of over overall healthcare, of universal healthcare, um, of trying to figure out ways to uh, to spread those costs. And, and you know, just just like we have, I don't have, a, the bottom line is I'm spitballing. I don't have a good answer to the, the high costs, but I could see that there are nonprofit organizations out there also that do uh, some of this work where they do help treat animals for free. Um, and that's important. The voucher system that we have for spay and neuter is important, but it's, you know, I'll tell you, it's very hard getting that money that we do get. Now, you know, you can always put a fee on certain things, like there's a fee on, on, on permits that helps go to spay and neuter, um, but that has consequences too, because fees have to be directly related to the, the uh, purpose of what the, the fee is for. So it's not like we could put a fee on on stop signs and then put that money toward uh, animal care. Uh, so it, it's, there's no good answer to it. I wish there were, or I'm open to good answers, but it's a, you know, working with the nonprofit sector, working, trying to get vouchers is the best uh, path I see forward. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, I see a hand raised by Lisa. Lisa, go ahead and unmute yourself. You're welcome to come off camera if you're comfortable. <laughs> Hi, um, I uh, when I moved to LA ten years ago, and um, shortly after moving, I heard about the overpass on 101 that was going to be built or was going to try to be built um, to help wildlife cross uh, the highway, and. I then I haven't heard anything and I know it's probably you know not I know it's not like a, a city um uh, approved or uh financed thing but what is is, is there uh, an update does anybody know anything more about uh the status of that and what we can do to help get that faster moving you know uh, built faster or moving so forward the super cool thing about that is that one of the hardest things with a situation that involves so many different administrative agencies is just that, trying to get all those people on board and also the people that live in the area. Um, National Wildlife Federation is the group that's sort of taking the helm on this one. And they're also the group that's in charge of uh, doing P22 Day in Griffith Park, right? which is largely an event to get out information about that crossing. Um, so it is going to be, it's going to be over Liberty Canyon, which I'm pretty sure is actually Ventura County, um, but it is slated to be the largest wildlife overpass in the world because it's the 101 and it's like huge, right, in that area. Um, and so the last that I have heard is that they were planning to break ground at the end of this year. So, and it should just be uh, I think it's just a couple year project. I don't know all the details on it. Um, I do know that if you, uh, what is it? SaveLACougars.org is the website. They have all the latest information there. They will be updating everyone in, in October because that's the big P22 day stuff. 
Um, and obviously this is not a crossing that's going to affect P22, but he's kind of our poster guy, letting everyone know how cool cougars are. Um, so, so yeah, so it is, they've been, you know, getting grants, really, really the number one thing in the way is money. And at the end of the day, if people can get the word out about getting donations in for that, it will speed it along. But um, it is moving forward. Everyone is in agreement that it needs to happen. So that's all the good news. It's literally just a matter of time and money. But they do, they are getting in, you know, large grants from Annenberg Foundation and other, you know, big organizations that care about this stuff. And it's going to affect, it's, you know, the poster child is again the mountain lion, but this sort of overpass, it's so cool. They have mycologists there that are gonna literally be inoculating the soil on the overpass so that when the animals go, it'll have the same bacteria, it'll have the same smells as the ground around it. And so everybody ideally would use it from insects and lizards all the way up to mountain lions. So it's pretty cool. And it, they should be breaking down by the, breaking ground by the end of this year but savelacougars.org is your update source for that. Awesome, thank you so much. Great, now I'll just add a couple of, a couple of things. You know, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I, you know, I remember talking about that years and years ago when I worked for the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, we were talking about how we can create more of these uh, wildlife corridors over the highway. So I saw plans for this decades ago, uh, but, uh, and in fact, and, and on the city level, I introduced the motion back in, 2016 uh, to put the city officially on record uh, supporting this overpath. And uh, so excited about that. Yeah, it's been the field art. And, and then uh, this year, although it's not directly related, in this year's budget, we were able to put funding in for planning department staff to complete a wildlife corridor study, which is tangentially related because that's important uh, to all of these different wildlife corridors. Obviously, the the, the the, the, the big mega daddy of them all is, is the overpass like over the 101, but that's, uh, it's, it's part and parcel of this bigger initiative of how do we connect um, all of our different wildlife areas for, for the benefit of the ecosystem and the wildlife and, and all of us. You're on mute, Jeff. I think we have time for last question from Pamela. Actually, I just want to add to the discussion uh, about the wildlife corridor. Um, my latest information was that I believe you mentioned the Annenberg grant that was for 20 million. So they're now, uh, I think it's only five to six uh, thousand dollars more that they need to raise and it would not begin it's not 21 i believe it's the end of 22 uh 2022 that they're going to actually begin construction of this overpass and i like to think it's to help p22 get a mate so hopefully it will help him as well um and i just urge everyone who's um you know in this uh session right now. Um, if you could do what Dana suggested and go to savelacougars.org, uh, you know, five, 10 bucks. Come on, people. We, we just need a few thousand more. Let's do this. And I love it. You know, get educated. We have lions here. It's incredible. What an incredible natural resource. We have these engineers that we don't even have to pay to manage our ecosystem, right? So yeah, check it out, get educated. Okay, we're gonna get cut off, I think in one minute. Um, thank you, Bob and Dana for participating. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone who got up this early to watch this. This is also going to be, it's recorded. It'll be, I think, on YouTube. Thank you to the Congress of Neighborhoods. And if you want to help animals, get involved with your neighborhood councils. If you're already on a neighborhood council, form an animal welfare committee. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.